Open with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians, Paul's first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 1. Heavenly Father, we ask you to meet with us now in the power and presence of your Spirit. In your grace and in your mercy, open our eyes, our minds, and above all our hearts to the glory and meaning of your word. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. This was almost certainly written somewhere around the time 55 AD from Corinth. Because of persecution and opposition from both pagan and Jew alike, Paul did not spend very long at this particular church, and he was concerned with it. He was concerned with the people who were saved under his ministry. He was concerned with the church he planted. But the central theme of this epistle has to do with the resurrection, the rapture, the coming event. There's two of Paul's epistles which deal most with this subject. One is, of course, 1 Corinthians, and the other is 1 Thessalonians. And he's writing them both concerning the same issues, one to Corinth and one from Corinth, as we have here in Thessalonians. This idea of the resurrection, Easter Sunday. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells us in verse 20 that Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. Now what that means is this. This week, my wife, my children, they're in Israel for Passover. And this is one of the years where the lunar calendar of the Hebrews and the solar calendar of the Western Church almost coincide. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus did not, was not crucified on Good Friday, neither did he raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. That came about with the quadridecimian schism in the early church. In fact, it happened on or around the 14th of the Hebrew month of Nisan. It happened at Passover. That's when actual crucifixion was, and that's when he rose from the dead. It was only later that they moved it to the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, when the church began to lose its Hebrew root and even take on some pagan influences. So this idea of Jesus as the first root, what happens? The high priest would go into the Kidron Valley, which lies between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives, precisely at sunrise. And he'd look for the first bit of grain for the summer harvest, the, sorry, the spring harvest, coming out of the earth. And he'd have to wait for the first pin of sunlight to appear in back of the Mount of Olives. And as soon as he saw the first light, the rising of the sun, he would ceremonially harvest the first bit of grain, and he'd bring it through the east gate into the temple. He would call that the first fruit. Now, all four Gospels tell us that very day, the first day of Hag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, is the day Jesus rose from the dead. However, all four Gospels, if we notice, associate the resurrection with sunrise. He rose at about dawn. The rising of the S-O-N is represented by the rising of the S-U-N. One is the metaphor for the other. So the very hour when the high priest was bringing the first fruit into the temple, Jesus was the first fruit raising from the dead, perfectly fulfilling the Hebrew feast of first fruit. But there's more to it than that. What does first fruit mean? It means that his resurrection is something that a theologian would call proliptic. In other words, his resurrection and our resurrection are the same event. Jesus is simply the chronological first fruit of it. What happens to him happens to us. This is what the prophet Hosea was talking about in chapter 6, verse 2. He will revive us after two days and raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Now it is possible to say that because the day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, this would indicate that Jesus is coming somewhere between the second and third millennium. That's not date setting, it's simply a possible interpretation. That's a thousand year span anyway. But he will revive us after two days and raise us up. What happens to Jesus happens to us. When the church in Thessalonica was being persecuted, that was their hope. They had no hope in this life or this world. Their only hope was in this coming resurrection event. That was their only hope. The resurrection and the rapture was their only hope. Today there's places like northern Nigeria, southern Sudan, where saved Christians are being terribly persecuted by Muslims. Unspeakably persecuted. 
by Islam. And the darkness of Islam is hovering over this nation. You know, when you read the Quran, when Muslims were in the minority in the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad first taught we should not use coercion to get people to become Muslims. But after they became in the majority, then they began using coercion. And it's always been the Islamic strategy. Whenever they're in the minority, oh, don't persecute us, we're peaceable people. But as soon as they begin getting a majority, as they have in places like Bradford, they get militant. Now, I don't mean that in a racist way at all. I mean that in the sense of religion. Christians in places like this, where they're being persecuted, China, Iran, Iraq, they have no hope. I was reading the Amnesty International website the other night, and again, Christians in Saudi Arabia, if they're a Muslim who becomes a Christian, they cut their head off. Simple. No problem. No problem. And of course, neither the American nor the British government have any problems sweeping that under the rug and protecting those countries. They won't protect Christians. No. Those Christians only have one hope, the return of Jesus. But when we're not being persecuted, when our freedoms seem to be guaranteed, which there really aren't, we don't hope in the resurrection or think about it as much. In fact, we get taken up by a lot of other things. And a lot of the things taking up the church today are not new issues. They're the very same kinds of things that Paul had to contend with when he wrote 1 Thessalonians urging them to look to the resurrection, to the rapture. Let's look at chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. The underlying Hebrew thought would be, Hesed lechem v'shalom mi'et elohim avinu v'ha'adon Yeshua HaMashiach. It was Paul's standard introduction. The reason he would do that is this. It was one of the ways they identified him, both by his signature and by his standard introduction. There were people going around erroneously, falsely claiming apostolic authority and reporting things that they said originated with Paul. This became a big problem in Thessalonica, and in the second epistle, Paul warns people coming as if saying that they're from us, teaching you these things. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your faith, your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness in the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they report themselves about us, what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Once again, the focus is always on Jesus having risen, and Jesus coming back to either rapture us or rescue us from the wrath of God that is to come. And now, of course, we're nearly 2,000 years closer to that time than we were when this was written. But so the story continues. He says, we came to you in power. But today, something has happened. The kind of power that Paul emphasizes is not the signs, wonders, and miracles. Those things happened. They had their place. But the real kind of power, he said, we came to you with, and the real kind of power I see in you is something different. It's not manifestations. It's not signs, wonders, gifts of the Spirit, or miracles. It's your capacity to stand during philipsis, persecution, trials. The real test of a Christian's power is not being able to blow on people and knock them down or to wave a coat and see people fall down. Stage hypnotists can do that at Blackpool Pier. 
The real power that Jesus was talking about was the power to stand under difficult times. The real test of a Christian's power is not how loud the music is, it's not what kind of manifestations take place, it's not even things that in and of themselves can be right and good like gifts of the Spirit. The real test of dunamis, of power, was the capacity to stand strong in trials. He said, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit, with full conviction. You became imitators of us, having received the word in much tribulation. Something has gone very, very wrong in modern times. This particular church is similar to the one I attend. It is a more traditional Pentecostal church. Most of the things that have happened in popular Pentecostal circles have not happened in churches like this one, but this church would be an exception. Undoubtedly, you've all encountered it. Charismania that's invaded Pentecostalism. And what has happened in this is this. Cheap grace. Grace is free, but it is not cheap. It cost God everything when he gave his son. Paul told these people from the word go, right from the beginning, you're being saved into tribulation. It says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verse 8, there is no discharge from war. When you become a Christian, you enlist in God's army. And in the army, there's a war. We are operating on the enemy's territory. He's not going to take it sitting down. This is reality. Count the cost. Do you really want to enlist in the army? Do you really want to go to war? There's no way out of this war. As long as you are alive, you will be in this war. Now you'll have a peace that passes all understanding. A peace with God. But not peace as the world gives. You're in a war. There's tribulation. Jesus said you will have tribulation in the world. It's a guarantee. If you are a Christian and you are not having tribulation, in some measure, in some way, you better make sure you are a Christian. Today, people aren't being told this anymore. In the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus speaks of the ones who are on shallow ground, and when the cares of this life came, persecution came, they were choked off and died. How many people who go forth in stadium rallies, things like Louis Palu or Billy Graham, and I'm not against Billy Graham, I've always liked Billy Graham. However, in recent years, he's begun putting converts in Roman churches. And that's something I can't endorse anymore. But how many of those people coming forth at stadiums, it seems wonderful, thousands and thousands and thousands are coming down, come back a year later, or six months later, how many are committed Christians? A very, very small minority. Paul told people to count the costs. Jesus never said, never said to make converts. Never. He said, make disciples. Never said to make converts. What do you see today? Every eye closed, every head bowed, accept Jesus into your heart. God has a wonderful plan for your life. Just put your hand up and accept it. The gospel's preached that way quite a lot, isn't it? Jesus called people out to come publicly. Even Billy Graham says that. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. A half-truth is as deadly as any other lie. Maybe even more deadly. Oh, it's true. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It's also true you have enlisted in a war. There's a Jewish Christian, a Messianic Jew from New Zealand, whose name is Ray Comfort. He's a very good Bible teacher and evangelist. And he said when he was first born again, he thought at last he saw light at the end of the tunnel. But no one told him it was a locomotive coming straight for him at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> Jesus never said to make converts. The charismatic movement is chuck a block filled with people who were never even saved, many of them. They had some kind of religious emotional experience. They joined the movement, but were never born again. When you have cheap grace, put your hand up. God loves you. Accept Jesus into your heart, but you don't tell people to count the cost. You're not looking for disciples. You're looking for numbers, converts. They'll never stand. But it gets even worse. 
The first step, for instance, in biblical discipleship is believe his doctrine. Find me one book of the Alpha Course that teaches believe his doctrine. The first step, the first biblical step, is baptism. Find me an Alpha Course that teaches that. You won't find it. There's no Alpha book that teaches that. It's, of course, something called Tradudianism, Sanguinism. It goes for the unchurched, not necessarily the unsaved. It's only one of many problems. Is it a new life or is it a new lifestyle? Paul didn't preach that way. He told people straight up what they were heading for. He told them, you have an enemy. He told them, you have an old nature God is going to be dealing with. He told them, there will be opposition. There will be ellipses. If people don't count the cost, they don't know what they're buying. They won't be disciples. There'll be people who will fall away in a persecution, fall away in a hardship. Paul didn't preach that way. I have a letter from a Bible teacher, teacher in a Bible college in Auckland, New Zealand, the Elam Bible College in Auckland, New Zealand. And he was told, we don't preach repentance anymore. It's a negative message. We have a positive message. We preach grace. Unless you have repentance, you can't have grace. But that's what they're teaching. This is horrible. But it's what's happening. Paul did not do that. You see, people, give me the good news. Give me the good news. Give me the good news. And Paul keeps talking about the gospel, the good news. But we redefine good news differently than God does. Something has happened. Now he continues in chapter 2. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we'd already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst much opposition. He uses the term, the gospel of God. In Ephesians or Isaiah, it's the gospel of peace. In 1 Corinthians, he personalizes it as my gospel. Elsewhere, it's the gospel of salvation. Eschatologically, in things like Matthew 24, it's the gospel of the kingdom. But here it's simply the gospel of God. Why? Because Christianity began as a messianic sect within Judaism. Jews had the true God. They had the scriptures. Most of these people were pagan Greeks. Totally Hellenistic, totally pagan. They had no concept of God. To the Jew, they already had the God. They just didn't have the good news of the salvation. Hence, for the Jew, it would be the gospel of salvation. But to the pagans, it was the gospel of God, because they had no previous contact with the real God until they'd gotten saved. Some of them would have been God-fearers, but they wouldn't have had any kind of concept the way the Jews would have had until they were saved. Hence, it's not the gospel of peace in this context. It's not the gospel of, of the kingdom. It's the gospel of God. Whenever the gospel goes to people with no Jewish background, says the gospel of God because they had no reference for God before this. But then he continues. It's all the same gospel, of course, but different aspects. And he talks about, again, opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines the hearts. We never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory for men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our own authority. He begins by saying, we've been entrusted with this gospel, not pleasing men, and our exhortation did not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Error impurity by way of deceit. What Paul is doing is he is comparing his ministry. He's comparing his gospel. He's comparing what he and Sylvanus and Timothy were teaching with something other people were teaching. There's nothing new under the sun. They had a false gospel. They had a wrong definition of what good news was that you don't have to suffer anymore, that you know, you're not going to be persecuted, 
that it's going to be all bliss and blessing. Paul was saying, it's not like that. Error, impurity, deceit. The three go together, one begets the other. Those who Paul was comparing himself and Sylvanus and Timothy to were people who were teaching error, impurity, and deceit. Let's begin with error. The New Testament contains twice as much exhortation to right doctrine as it does right conduct. The New Testament talks twice as much about having right doctrine, right teaching, as it does right conduct. Why? If we do not know what right doctrine is, we will not know what right conduct is. Today, people say things, the popular mentality is, we don't want to argue about doctrine. Doctrine brings division. Forgetting that in 1 Corinthians 11, 19 and Romans 16, 17, that's exactly what it was designed to do. There must be factions among you. The Greek word is heresy. To prove which is true. Something has gone very, very wrong in the church today. In the Bible, there is the unity of the spirit. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, not of error. You cannot have a unity of the spirit based on error. In the Bible, unity among churches was based on one thing. One faith, one baptism. They had the same doctrine and the same salvation. The same doctrine and the same salvation. That's what unity among churches was based on in the Bible. The world's unity is based on the Tower of Babel. Organizational unity. What you're seeing happening in so many of our churches and denominations is this. The autonomy of the local congregation is being eroded, taken away in the name of unity. Doctrine, which is the real cement that's to hold churches together, is being sacrificed in the name of unity. So instead of having the biblical unity based on the same doctrine and the same gospel, you have a unity based on organization, churches together, programs based on compromise doctrine. Anything goes, even the gospel itself. So what if our Roman Catholic friends and relatives believe they're going to atone in purgatory for their own sin when the Bible says the blood of Christ comes from all sin? We have to be united. We can't let the gospel cause the vision. That's what they're saying. That's exactly what they're saying. I'm not against Catholic people, my mother's Catholic. I wanted to be saved. But the fact is, an angel of God comes from another gospel. Paul says, get away from me. Today, it's not one faith, one baptism. You have people believing anything, coming into all kinds of ecumenical unity and into faith. The autonomy of the local congregation is being eroded. Things are getting more centralized, more hierarchical. Instead of unity based on common truth, it becomes unity based on common politics. The truth be damned. That's exactly what it has come. Ever. The first thing Paul says is, we didn't come to you teaching you any error. There was no false teaching. There was no false doctrine. Unless the doctrine is right, everything else is wrong. Let no one tell you doctrine is not important. Doctrine is the teaching of Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. It's the teaching of Jesus. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is the truth. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. If his if doctrine is not important to you, he's not important to you. He is the incarnate word. If the word is not important, then Jesus is not important. And that's what's happened. He's being eroded. Same as the sovereignty of the congregation is being eroded. The first thing that happens is error. The second is impurity. This word, I read this in Greek last night, I read the whole book in Greek last night, the word is a catharsis. 
We get the word catharsis. Catharsis means you cleanse something. You clean something. You remove that which is unclean from that which is clean. Catharsis means you separate that which is clean from that which is unclean. The Greek word here for impurity is a catharsis. It means a mixture of clean and unclean. Today, you're finding the mixture, impurity. What are they saying? Oh, well, there's some good in Toronto. There's some youth in Pensacola. We don't want to reject the whole thing. The very fact that it is a mixture tells you it is wrong. The Hebrews were forbidden from making a garment that was made out of flax and wool. God hates the mixture. A mixture of light and dark, a mixture of truth and error, a mixture of what is spiritual and what is carnal. God hates these things. It is a catharsis. It is uncleansed. What is unclean has not been separated from that which God calls clean. It is a mixture. Oh, there's some good in it. Some people say they're being blessed. Some people... The fact that it's a mixture tells you it's not of God. What did Satan do when he tempted Jesus? He distorted scriptures out of context. What did he do when he tempted Adam and Eve? Distorted scriptures out of context. Oh, there's some truth in it. Of course there is some truth in it. We have a paper on true and false prophets where we talk about from 2 Peter. And 2 Peter says, there will be false teachers and false prophets. And he uses them interchangeably. If somebody's doctrine is wrong, their prophecies will be wrong. And he says, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. That phrase, or that term, secretly introduced destructive heresies, is man's best effort to translate a very difficult Greek word, parasoxusin, which we explain on the tape, which means putting truth next to error. Oh, there's some truth in what these people are saying. There's some truth in Kenneth Copeland. There's some truth in Benny Hinn. There's some, tr there's some truth in Jehovah's Witnesses. There's some truth, as I always point out, there is always real cheese in a rat trap. Parasocution is putting truth next to error. The mixture, the very fact that there is a mixture of what is clean and unclean, what is carnal and what is spiritual, what is biblical and what is unbiblical, the very fact that there's a mixture tells you it's not of God. So you go from doctrinal error, false teaching, then you'll come into this impurity, the mixture. But then comes the third phase, guile, deceit. Once you have the false doctrine leading to a mixture, it is inevitable you will wind up with spiritual deception. But then Paul takes it even further. He says, it's not only spiritual deception these guys are on about, they have a motive for doing it. Look what he says. Verse 5, he's comparing himself to them. They come on with flattering speech because it's a pretext for greed. When you find people teaching doctrinal error, accommodating a mixture, you will find deception. And on the back of that deception, you'll always find one particular person. The person is not Jesus. The person is not Paul. The person is not one of the Hebrew prophets or one of the apostles. You will always find George. There's always money on back of it. The people who do this, who preach this, who carry on this way, they go from error to mixture, mixture to deception, but it's about money. Even the way they talk, Paul says, even the way they carry on, the way they preach, it's to flatter people because they're out for money. Benny Hinn didn't invent this stuff. Nothing new under the sun. It's always gone on. Perhaps not in the way of mass media, but it's always but there's always been people like this. Now put this together so far. 
not preaching a true gospel, not telling people about the need to be disciples, not telling people they're going to face opposition, hardship, and tribulation, not spiritually or psychologically preparing them for the reality of a Christian life, not giving them the right standard of power, which is perseverance under hardship. Instead, it's blowing on people and all this stuff. Then they teach error. Then there's a mixture of things which seem to be some of God, some of it not. But then there's all perception. Ultimately, the smooth talkers, flattering people, because they're out for the uh, fun. That's what was going on. Paul says, we didn't come to you that way. But then the story continues. We didn't seek the glory of men. We proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Now in verse 7, the word mother is not in the Greek text. I read it last night. The word is simply trophos. Trophos, meaning a nursemaid, one who professionally looks after small babies. Paul looked after these people he led to Christ as babies, babes in Christ. What he's saying is, not the way a mother looks after her baby, but he combines the two things. A professional nursemaid, a professional uh, who, who looks after babies, say like a, a neonatal nurse today would be the equivalent, okay? How much more would she look after her own baby? So you have a professional person who does this anyway but cares for this particular baby as if it were their own biological child. That's what he's saying. His whole concern was for the welfare of these people he led to Christ. These other guys were out of the buck. Paul's concern was the people I led to Jesus. How are they standing under hardship? But then the story goes even further. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you become very dear to us. We recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. I accept the fact that a church will get to a certain size, that it will need a full-time pastor. You know, one of the things I admired about Jeff Windsor the most when he was our pastor is he planted a church and went to work every day in a secular job. Now, when a church reaches a certain size, the pastor has to go full time, praise the Lord. You know, when I lived in Israel, I led a congregation in Galilee, and I worked every day filling prescriptions in a pharmacy because it's the only thing I knew how to do. If somebody is not willing to earn their bread, the way you earn your bread. They shouldn't be considered a candidate to be paid for full time ministry. So much of the contemporary ministry in Pentecostal churches, I've said it a number of times, has become a dumping ground for people who cannot do anything else. Very important. Very, very important. Why should you support someone who does not work as hard as you do? Paul says that those who work hard in preaching and teaching the word of God deserve to be supported. Why should you support people like that? Somebody who stands up week after week giving a lot of waffle and hype, people like that shouldn't be paid. People like that shouldn't be paid. Paul, so as not to financially burden the church. So tense. Our church was made up of of a lot of people. We had single mothers, we had people from the council of state. Few professional people, but not many. That church couldn't afford to pay for instance, Jeff Asalvi. Jeff went to work every day. Paulie ran a business from home. Why? Because it was his calling. It was not his career. His care was for the Lord and the sheep and for the young saved. Once again, there was a famous rabbi who said the following. Where your heart is, then your treasure will be also. How do these people stand on the issue of money? 
You'll always find the guys who are out of the box and stand out like sword dogs. The New Testament says very little about money, and most of what it does say is pretty negative. Some of these guys preach about hiding every other sermon. Now let's look even further. He continues. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devotely and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father with his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom. And for this reason, we constantly also thank God that when you received from us the word of God's message, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which he performs its work in you who believe. Now the word there for word is logon, same as logos. It is not simply printed word. It is the Lord Jesus. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. You know, I've been an evangelist to the Jews for 20 years, and I've seen some very, very sad situations. I know a young Hasidic girl from a Hasidic Jewish family in Manchester. If her own family saw her on the street, they'd ignore her, because when she accepted Jesus, they had a funeral for her. She's dead. But that doesn't only happen to Jewish people. I've seen that happen in Northern Ireland to Catholics who've gotten saved, young Catholic people. And their families thinking, don't you know what the Protestants did to us, how they divided our land? Don't you know about the potato famine? Now you're one of them. I've seen this with American Indians who've gotten saved in the American West. They left the tribal religions of the reservation and became believers in Jesus. And they were told, don't you know how the Christian Europeans came over here and killed the buffalo? Took our land, now you're one of them. Boy, the devil knows his business, doesn't he? What was the test? Are people turning against you? If the church was really having the kind of impact it was designed to have, people wouldn't like it. It's not to say you should seek persecution or seek to make trouble. But it is to say, if the church was really being the kind of influence God intended it to, to be, to have, it would automatically generate persecution. Look what happened to the Methodists in this country. Did you ever read John Wesley's journals? What happened? The established church used to set up mobs against him to attack him in Whitfield. It automatically resulted in opposition. If there's no opposition, the church is not being effective. That's not what you hear being preached today. But let's continue. But we, brethren, having been bereft of you for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan thwarted us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. His hope was the rapture. His hope was the resurrection. His whole hope was Jesus. And his joy was what he would have to present to Jesus those he led to Christ. It says in Daniel, the wise man delivers souls. Many will, those who turn many to righteousness will burn forever like the stars, it says in Daniel. When you come back, Jesus is going to be looking for something. He's looking for fruit. Now there's two basic kinds of fruit in the Bible. The fruit of the Spirit, but also the fruit of souls. We're not all evangelists, but we're all witnesses. And this was Paul's hope. His whole thing was, how many people have I led to Christ who remain faithful under persecution that I can present to Jesus when he comes? It wasn't how much money he made or the big numbers. It was, 
quality, not quantity. But look what he says here. I wanted to come to you, but Satan hindered us. More than once he hindered us. Now compare that to the kind of hype you hear today. Two or three of you agree. My name, it shall be done for you, hallelujah. Satan can't stand against us. We have the victory in Jesus. We bind the spirit of satanic opposition. We're going to go forth and claim the victory in Jesus. Satan can't stand it. What rubbish. They're taking every one of those verses out of context to arrive at conclusions that are simply not biblical. One of these con men actually said, well, Paul didn't have the vision. Paul didn't have faith. Benny Hinn called Job a disgusting carnal man because he suffered. Look what Paul says. Satan is the god of this world. He can hinder us. He can make all kinds of things go wrong. Telephones ringing, computers malfunctioning, babies getting sick, stepping on a jack. Anything. Anything. He certainly can hinder us. God's strategy is a gambit like in a chess game. In a chess game, the penultimate goal is to get your opponent's queen and put his king into check. Got your queen, check. No, nope. checkmate. The resurrection was God's gambit. Satan thought he won when he crucified Jesus. Satan can get victories. God allows Satan to get victories because it's always something that will backfire on him. It's a gambit. In the early church, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Satan killed many Christians through these pagan emperors and so on. But it caused the church to grow, to be purified, get rid of the heretics, the compromisers. A gambit. The Bible doesn't say all things work for the better. It says all things work together for the better. In a theological seminary in the United States, a group of seminarians were studying for a big Greek exam. And they were studying, studying, studying how to pass this exam to graduate for the next year. And they decided that they would take a one hour break because they'd been studying so much and they played American basketball for one hour. And they went out to play basketball. And they were just basically tied down to desks and studying and their eyes were squeamish and their muscles were cramped up and they wanted to react so they played basketball very energetically, perhaps even a bit too aggressively. And one of the students fouled his friend, causing his friend to fall and to badly injure his leg, his patella kneecap. And he felt terrible. The guy had to be taken to the hospital and have surgery to reattach his patella. He didn't take his Greek exam. He had to go to summer school to be able to move up to the next year. And he felt absolutely terrible. How could this have happened? How could I have injured my friend? And his friend was thinking, how could this have happened? Except before the surgery, they did an x-ray. And they found a previously undetected carcinoma that was still encapsulated. Matter of days, perhaps, the thing would not have been encapsulated. You would have had secondaries. It was successfully removed, removed by excision. No cancer. It was gone. It saved his life. It was a bad thing. All things work for the better. No, all things work together for the better. There will be times in your life and in my life and in your circumstance and my circumstance in your church and in my church where Satan will get victories in given situations. But through faith, through prayer, through perseverance, God will always turn those victories of Satan around into defeats. A gambit. Just like the resurrection. Satan tried to exterminate the Jews for the last time in the 1930s and 40s. Little did he know that that would have caused the international sentiment and sympathy to cause the Jews to go back to the land of Israel, fulfilling the prophecies of the prophets in Jesus. Holocaust was bad, of course it was, but God had a purpose in it. 
Satan can thwart us. There will be things in your life that Satan will attack you. And sometimes he will win. Or so he thinks. Lord, why did you allow this? Forget these people telling you this rubbish. Satan's a toothless tiger. That's not what the Bible says. It says in Jude's epistle, he was so powerful, the powerful angel just said, the Lord rebuked thee. Satan was the most perfect and powerful being God could have created without duplicating himself. It's not a joke. Today, people going around singing victory, and now is the time for us to march on the land, and we speak, and we take dominion. This is a lot of rubbish. We bind this. Is, this is not reality. When people are taught this nonsense, when Satan gets the victory, who do you think gets discouraged and loses their faith? Paul didn't teach that way. Does that sound like we claim the victory, we go forth in faith, we walk by faith, not by sight? Taking those verses out of context again, is that that it? No. Can a Christian reach the end of their spiritual rope? Can they reach the end of their emotional rope? Can they reach the end of their financial rope? Yes, they can. He said, we just could not take it anymore. There can be times in a Christian's life when they just cannot take it anymore. They can't take it anymore emotionally. They can't take it anymore spiritually. They can't take it anymore, perhaps even physically. Only then the Lord undertakes. Jesus says, I'll take your burden. Don't think Christians cannot reach the end of their spiritual and emotional rope. They certainly can do so. The targets of the enemy. Forget the hype being taught today. This becomes the problem. In our age, something terrible has happened. There is two kinds of psychology. There is biblical psychology, and there is secular psychology. Biblical psychology is largely based on the book of Proverbs. If you want to understand human behavior, if you want to know why people behave the way they do, read Proverbs. There is biblical psychology. But then there is secular psychology, which we'll come to in the last chapter. Secular psychology, today what's happening is secular psychology is being packaged in Christian jargon and passed on as doctrine. Pop psychology, psychobabble, is being packaged as Christian doctrine because it uses the jargon. If you go to a sales motivational seminar, you'll find preachers talking the same way. You need to realize your vision, and you need to sell others your vision. The same as you have in management training seminars, sales motivation seminars, the same rubbish gets into the church. Only it's not a vision, it's a hallucination. It didn't stop major companies from going bankrupt. It's not going to stop churches from collapsing. All they are doing is taking pop psychology, psychobabble, and packaging it as Christian doctrine. But it's not biblical psychology, it's not Christian doctrine. Positive thinking. This began with Norman Vincent Peale, a 33rd degree Freemason from Marble Collegiate Church in New York. His arch disciple was Robert Schuller, the Crystal Cathedral. Possibility thinking. Positive thinking. The power of positive thinking. It's what it is. It's not faith in Jesus, it's faith in faith. It's simply psycho battle. Satan can't get the victory over us, be positive. Look what happens when you show people, wait a minute, this is not right, this is not scriptural. That's negative, I don't see it. <laughs> All that negativity stuff, that comes from pop psychology. It's psychobabble, it's not biblical. It's nothing to do with the positive confession of the Bible. It has no biblical basis whatsoever. We don't receive that negativity. Well, my body's lying to me, I don't have a fever. This is nonsense. This is idiocy. But that's what they're teaching. It's not a new problem. 
So we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of the Messiah, to strengthen and encourage you to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. We've been destined for affliction. Destined. You know, I once read a book about how members of the SAS were trained. If somebody was extremely fit in the Royal Army, they could be a paratrooper. If somebody was intelligent, they could be in something like military intelligence. But somebody in the SAS had to be both clever and fit. They had to be both. And I was reading how they got going in the Second World War, and they had to learn things like how to speak fluent French and fluent German with the right accent. And they would parachute them into France, and they would train the French partisans to blow up bridges and things like this. They were operating on back of enemy lines. And some of the training was almost absurd, it would seem, but it was all designed to make these people endure the hardship they were going to be tested for. You know, the physical training was, of course, grueling in itself. But the psychological training was perhaps even worse. They put people in a, in a pit with dead sheep, just so you'd be around the stench of death. Have to stay there for 24 hours. Have people sleep in a morgue with dead bodies, with dead soldiers, and just lock them up in there, and leave them in there with, dead, with dead, dead bodies, and you just be in there with these dead bodies for a few days of dead soldiers in uniforms before they, before they embalm them. Just leave them in there. So if you were ever in a situation where all your unit was killed, you were the only one alive, and you're surrounded by your dead comrades, and see. And this went on like this. How to survive and back to the enemy? It was something you were destined for. Well, God's army is like that. It's something we're destined for. There's a kind of training. One of the ways God trains us is discipleship, certainly Bible study, but also He brings us through difficult times to train us for even more difficult times still. That's normative. But today, with the top cycle battle, no, no, claim the victory, Paul didn't have the vision, we're going forth in triumph, this is a lot of rubbish. That's why we have a defeated church. This is, to a large extent, why the Mormons are the fastest growing Christian sect in this country, if you want to call them Christian. It's the reason there's more mosques being built than churches. It's the reason the fastest growing religion of any description is Wicca. And the fastest institutionalized religion in growth in Britain is Islam. We have a defeated church because we're not even training the soldiers to fight the war. Think they can talk themselves into a victory? Indeed, we kept telling you in advance in verse 4, we're going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. Now, compare this with chapter 1, when he says, because you suffered that same affliction, you were an example to others. They saw, Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Jesus suffered affliction. Paul and his followers suffer affliction. But then he talks about these people having become examples to others in verse 7 of chapter 1. You know, in the Pentecostal churches 30 years ago, you know who the examples were? Who would speak at the uh, Young People's Fellowship? Things like this? It would be missionaries. Home on deputation. It would be people like William Burton, people like that, who come back from the Congo, uh, the, the, the Amazon or something like this. And all the, the, the youth, young people in the church would want to hear these stories of, of, of headhunters being saved in New Guinea and cannibals being saved. These people who left house and home to be pioneers for the gospel in uncharted territories. These were the role models. People who knew how to suffer hardship for the sake of the gospel. Those were the examples that they held up for young people. Today it's some jerk with a yellow jacket to kneel down and touch it for a double portion of the anointing of the Spirit. It's some clown with a big BMW. That's the kind of role models that are holding up the kids today in our churches. Thanks, thankfully, not this one, but in so many Pentecostal churches. These are the kinds of role models they bring in to speak at Bible colleges. Instead of taking the missionaries home on deputation, coming back from the third world or something, they're taking people like this. These are unexampled examples of anything, except worldliness and artificial Christianity that doesn't work. You can't bring a victory and won't stand under persecution or hardship. That's the only thing it's an example of. 
So Paul continues. Now he gets personal. In verse 5, for this reason, when I can endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor should be in vain. Now he gets personal. Now it's not that we couldn't take it anymore. Now he says, I can't take it anymore. Paul reached the end of his rope. There's been more than one time when I have reached the end of my rope. You know what? The Lord is always there, not in the court. Can't trust yourself. Don't think when you reach the end of your rope, it means you're unspiritual. It might mean that you're quite close to Jesus. It might mean that you're exactly where God wants you to be, otherwise you wouldn't be having those problems. It might mean that. And then he says, his fear was that the tempter might have tempted you. Turn with me very briefly, please, to understand what Paul is saying here to Daniel chapter 7. He says here in verse 21, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came. He goes on talking about, in verse 25, he will wear down the saints of the Most High. Now this was a prophecy about Antiochus Epiphanes, and it's a prophecy about the Antichrist, but it also reveals something about Satan. He tries to wear us down. He tries to wear us out spiritually. He tries to wear us out psychologically. He tries to wear us out in our physical health. He tries to wear us out financially. He tries to wear us out. But when you are at the end of your rope because he's worn you out, you become particularly vulnerable to temptation. You understand? First he gets you this way, wearing you out, wearing you out, wearing you out. But then when you are spiritually and emotionally exhausted, you become hyper-susceptible to temptation because your resilience has been eroded. That's when he tries to get us into sin. When you've been worn out emotionally and spiritually, you will perhaps give in to kinds of sin you wouldn't in better days. For me, I can get so angry when I've just about had it with the way things are, I can get so angry and say the most unspeakable things. Even though the anger is justified, my reaction to it isn't always. What happens? I get worn out spiritually, I get worn out psychologically, and then the tempter goes in and he knows. He knows what button to push. This was Paul's prayer. He understood these things. Don't think it won't happen to you. If it can happen to an apostle, where does that put the rest of us? His great fear was that his labor should have been in vain. As long as the people he led to Christ were staying faithful and standing under hardship, as long as the churches he planted were standing, that was all he cared about. But now that Timothy has come to us and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we long to see you. You see in verse 6 the term good news? Evangelion. It's the same as the word for gospel. The real good news, in other words, previously he's saying the gospel of God, but it's the same word. The real good news is not people being saved. The real good news is people being saved and staying faithful during times of hardship. People being saved, that's only half the good news. Being born again, that's half the good news. Somebody getting, being converted, that's half the good news. The other half is being a disciple. The proof of discipleship is standing when things are difficult. For this reason, brethren, in all of our distress and affliction, again the word ellipses, we were comforted about you through your faith. 
For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men just as we also do for you. So that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. For Paul, the payoff was these people staying faithful. Now you have no chapter divisions in the original Greek text. The thoughts just continue. We put those in later. He begins building up to the hope. Despite the hardship, what's the hope? The hope is the resurrection. Stay faithful. Finally, brethren, we request and exhort you the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of our Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion, just as the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter be because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, just as we also told you and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. The Greeks had a sex-charged society. The hieros gamos, cult prostitutes, temple prostitution was all over the place. Fornication was seen as socially normative. Adultery was acceptable. Cult prostitution was part of the religious culture. They even put a kind of religious benediction on it. Bisexuality and homosexuality were normative. Today when you witness the unsaved people, yes, I sleep with my boyfriend, yes, I sleep with my girlfriend. We're not married, we live together. It's seen as socially normative, isn't it? Especially in the council states, it's seen as socially normative. It's not seen as something wrong. These Greeks had no concept or little concept of the stuff even being wrong. But Paul says it is. It was a sex-charged society. So he begins talking about what we should be like as an alternative to that. One is, of course, marriage. But then he says, don't marry for reasons of lust. Erotic love, sexual love, can enrich a marriage, but it can never be the basis of it. I remember reading Oscar Wilde, and he wrote a story of a, a honeymoon couple who went on their honeymoon to the Niagara Falls on the American-Canadian border. And he said the, uh, the chap wrote a postcard back to his family in Britain saying, you know, the falls weren't as quite as high or as spectacular as I thought they would be. That was my second disappointment. If you try to think that you can be sexually gratified on the basis of a, of a relationship just based on sexual attraction, that is wrong. People who try to marry for those reasons, the most attractive female or the most attractive male in the world, someone else will catch your eye. It just doesn't work that way. Yes, the attraction is there, and in this context, the attraction is good, but that can never be the basis of the marriage. If somebody marries for that reason, it's a very shallow reason to get married. But this was a big problem. A big, big problem. We've been called for sanctification. After you get married, you find out that when kids come along and the pressures of work and all the rest of it, that your love life is not always the number one priority. You can't build a marriage on something like that. Something like that's only icing on the cake, but it has no substance unless the rest of the relationship is right. Now, in a sex-charged society, that's a difficult message to convey to people. Divorce would have been unheard of among saved Christians when I was first saved. You never would have heard of a born-again Christian getting divorced from his wife or husband, unless they had an unsaved husband or an unsaved wife who left. 
But the idea of two saved Christians getting divorced would have been unheard of. Now ministers are doing it, and even being allowed to stay in the ministry. The biggest Pentecostal preacher in South Wales is getting divorced from his wife. They're getting divorced. He says, God gave me the vision of his new one. There's this deliverance place up in the north of England, Hell Al Grange or something like that. The guy runs the thing is divorced and remarried. What's going on here? Your wife's not as attractive as she was when you first married her? Try looking in the mirror. Who do you think you are? Hercules? <laughs> That's life, pal. One life, one wife, that's it. The mentality of the world getting into the church, and you're even finding Christians trying to manufacture some kind of a theological argument to justify getting divorced and remarried as Christians. But God still says it's wrong. Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gave his Holy Spirit to you. People who reject this idea of sanctification, particularly in regards to marital fidelity and things like this, they're rejecting God himself. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend your own business and work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you may behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Living our lives is a way that will give a positive testimony to the unsaved. But again, he uses this as a preface to what's coming. Even if you have a miserable job, a boring profession, an unsatisfying career, so what? This is not your life anyway. This is not your circumstances anyway, is what he's saying. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now he begins talking about the coming Easter, the coming resurrection. The word for sleep here, I read last night, is interesting. It's koma menon, where you get the word koma, coma. It doesn't mean going to sleep, it means a comatose sleep. It means like human hibernation. It means a deep, long, protracted state of, of, uh, of being asleep, of uh, what's the medical term is sombre. I forget, I forget the medical term. You're in this comatose state. The Bible never speaks of the death of a Christian as death. It's always as sleep. If you go to sleep, you wake up again. Unsaved people die. Christians go to sleep. Lazarus is asleep. The little girl is asleep. Talitata Kumi. Unsaved people die. If you're here, you're not born again, you're going to die. If you're a Christian, you're going to go to sleep. Now, it may be a long sleep. It may be something akin to a coma. But when you go to sleep, the next thing you know is when you wake up, isn't it? Well, the next thing you're going to know is that you're with Jesus. And that's what he's saying. Now he uses an entirely different word later on in the epistle where he says, for those who sleep through their sleeping at night in verse 7. We have a tape series called Understanding the Rapture where we deal with chapter 5 in greater depth. But he builds up to this idea of the rapture and the coming of Jesus. Throughout the chapter 4 verses 17 and 18. Comfort one another with these words that will be caught up to meet him in the air. There's a man in America who's notorious for predicting things that don't happen. His name is uh, Rick Joyner. Who would call him? He says the rapture's a lie of the devil. In this country, Gerald Coates said the rapture's a fantasy and a myth. Notice what the Bible says. This stuff is our hope. We should comfort each other with the hope of the rapture and resurrection. But what is to be our very hope, our very comfort in times of hardship, these people are denying even takes place. You understand? The thing that we're supposed to cling to when a loved one dies, when we're 
facing death ourselves, the thing we're supposed to cling to when things are difficult is this coming wonderful event. Now the church, the church is teaching against it. Backsliding by definition means trusting in this world. Satan always wants us to trust in this life in some way. Backsliding means basically trusting in this world. It's not just falling away from the Lord. You fall away from the Lord because your hope is in this world. And so much of what's being propagated in the church today is designed to just do that. Get us the hope in this world. The Bible says no matter how good things get, don't trust it. And no matter how bad things get, don't get discouraged because it's all temporary. As to the times and epics, brethren, you have no one, uh, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves full, know full well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The night being a, a metaphor for the great tribulation. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. In Jeremiah 8, 11, and Revelation 12, you find this over and over, the metaphor of labor, the kind of labor, as what will happen before Jesus comes. We explain it in greater depth on the rapture tapes. However, look what it's saying. When men say peace and security, Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 11, he says the same thing. They heal the brokenness of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Now you understand what peace is. Some of you may know from our tapes. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom, but it comes from the Hebrew infinitive, le shalem, meaning to pay, to fill, and to fulfill. We have shalom, we have peace, because Jesus came to pay the price for our sin. He came to fulfill the law that we couldn't keep. And he came to fill us with his spirit. We have shalom because he came to le shalem. My peace I give you, not peace as the world gives you. He doesn't promise us peace in this life. He promises us shalom. Big difference. You can be in the biggest conflict of your life and have shalom. Or you can be in a totally, an environment of total conflict and lack it. Real shalom is fullness. Wholeness. You were God wants you to. A Christian in prison for his faith is in God's will. Has shalom. This is what God wants him to be. When they say peace and security, when they're saying shalom, what they're saying is everything is right. Everything is what it's supposed to be. Is in God's will. Has shalom. This is what God wants him to be. When they say peace and security, when they're saying shalom, what they're saying is everything is right. Everything is what it's supposed to be. Listen to the hype. Read the popular Pentecostal tabloids today. God is moving in power. There's victory in Jesus. There's revival. They're giving us a lot of nonsense. We're not going to be persecuted. We're going forth in victory. Then the end shall come. The very fact that this kind of rubbish is being propagated and believed shows us that Jesus is coming. We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us like a thief. A lot of people aren't going to be ready for him to come. Look at verse 7. Those who sleep, here he uses an entirely different word for sleep. It is not the word komenon. It's an entirely different different word. This word is cathedontes, like sleeping off a drunk. Somebody goes back from the pub with too much to drink and tries to sleep it off. What does he say? Those who sleep through their sleeping at night, those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we're of the day, let us be sober. Let us be drunk? No. Let us be sober. Repeatedly, the New Testament wants us to be sober in spirit. Three times in his first epistle, Peter says, be sober. Satan wants to devour you. You know, I was once driving through the bush country in Africa, and I was in a, a rover, and, and a wheel went flat. And it was lion country, and the guy who was driving me knew by the kind that he saw giraffes, and he said, lions stalk giraffes, 
So we know this is lion country. We have to be careful. It was beginning to get dark. Now, if you're around in a place like that, miles and miles from any civilization, and there's lions around, the last thing you want to be when it's getting dark in the bush is drunk. The last thing you want to be. Of course, the same thing spiritually. Only today, they're saying this is a blessing. No, it's a deception. Now the story continues. Since we're of the day, let us be sober. Verse 12, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all men. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek that which is good for one another and for all men. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, let's look at this. He talks about that you esteem or appreciate those who labor among you who have charge over you. This is not talking about heavy shepherding or Nicolaitanism. It is those who faithfully tend the sheep, giving them their proper food at the proper time. As Peter described it, we have a tape called the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherds, and the Hireling. Those who work hard at preaching and teaching the word of God, pastors of churches, it says, count worthy of double honorarium. Honor. But the word is Greek is honorarium, means money. Somebody who has to travel around teaching the Bible, somebody who has to pastor a church, he's called to be hospitable, he has to visit people, he has to do this, he has to do that, he has to look after this. It's a lot of money. The idea is so a faithful pastor or a faithful minister will not be burdened by unreasonable financial demands, the church should look after him, providing he's looking after the church. But only he should get double honorary. Not the other guy. Would you eat at McDonald's and pay the bill in Burger King? No. Where are you being fed? What church is teaching you the truth? What church is preaching the true gospel? Why should you go to a church week after week where they're not teaching and spamming the word of God? Where they're not giving you the spiritual food you need to make it to the next week? Why should you go to a place like that and support it? You shouldn't. You should support the ministries that feed you. You should support the pastor who tends to flock faithfully and teaches you the truth. Now let's look what happens here. Rejoice always. Verse 16, we cannot praise God for all things. We can praise God in all things. The Bible does not call us to praise God for all things. Count it as all joy, my breath, when you have trials. Yet when you have trials, but don't praise God for the trial. That's silly. You know, I like to watch the need of Chinese Christian very much, and his books were so good. But there was one or two things he, he wrote that simply were not scriptural. And in his book, The Spiritual Man, he said, if a Christian, if a spiritual man, if the Lord wants him to suffer, he's happy to suffer. That's ridiculous. Jesus was going to suffer. He said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Jesus didn't want to suffer. It's unnatural to want to suffer. It's unnatural to want hardship. We're not called to be unnatural, we're called to be supernatural. Being supernatural is, Father, let this cup pass from me, but your will be done, not mine. Lord, if you know that this difficulty, all things work together for the better, I'll trust you for the grace to go through this. If this is what you know is for the better, give me the grace to trust you. That's supernatural. But to want to suffer is unnatural. There is a balance. This idea of wanting to suffer is a Roman Catholic concept. It is not a biblical concept. It's all a kind of a religious massacre. It's simply not scriptural. It comes out, its origins are actually in Stoic Greek philosophy, certainly not in the Bible. 
We can't rejoice for all things. But we can rejoice in all things. Why? Because we're getting out of here. Because there's a resurrection. Because there's an Easter. Pray without ceasing. For everything give thanks. No, not for everything. In everything give thanks. Now in verse 19 he says, Do not quench the spirit. This becomes today's problem. Let's go back to the beginning. Who are the ones running around with the error, the impurity, and the deception? Who are the ones out for greed, flattering people to get money? Who are the ones not telling people the truth about the Christian life and the hardship that awaits true Christians? Who are the ones who are doing this? Hyper-charismatics and extreme Pentecostals. Something terrible has happened in the last five years. Something very unfortunate. So many people have been hurt or burned since Toronto and the laughing. So many people have been hurt in Assemblies of God churches and in Elam churches particularly. So many people have been hurt in charismatic churches that they become anti-charismatic. Some of them are becoming extremely reformed. Hyper Calvinistic, even I guess. Some are denying gifts of the Spirit. Some are becoming cessationists. Some are saying there is no tongues at all. They don't want anything to do with anything charismatic or Pentecostal because they've been hurt too much by the counterfeit. Would you take your money out of your wallet and put a match to it because somebody counterfeits 10 or 20 pound notes? Of course you will. The devil will only counterfeit something that is real. The solution to misuse is not no use, but proper use. In reaction, how be it understandable? I'm very sympathetic towards these people, and I can understand exactly why they're doing what they're doing. I have no problem in relating to why they're doing it. But because they've seen the counterfeit and the deception and the hype and the heresy, and because they've been hurt, perhaps financially exploited, because they've lost relationships, they're quenching the spirit. They're afraid of any prophecy, any tongue, any gift, any sign, any wonder, any manifestation. The Lord God in his infinite wisdom knew what was going to happen in the future. He certainly knew what was happening in Thessalonica. The very people who Paul was saying, look out for these other guys, Paul was telling them, don't quench the spirit. Just because most of the con men are charismatics or Pentecostals, that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the biblical Pentecostalism or gifts of the spirit. The devil wants you to quench the spirit. He doesn't want a proper use of the gifts. He doesn't want a proper understanding of the things of the Spirit. He doesn't want biblical manifestation. He wants to get rid of the real. That's why he introduced the counterfeit. The solution is not to get rid of helping to do it. That's not the solution. I know many, many people that have been so hurt or so burned by Toronto and Pensacola and the rest of the garbage that they've become a reactionary. They're against anything kind of cost is not right. Don't punch the spirit. Abstain, examine everything. Oh, sorry. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. John Arnett from the airport vineyard, I have a tape of his where he actually says, it's like a river. Just jump in. Don't try to test it. Don't try to examine it. Just go in and experience it. Who's telling the truth? Is it John Arnold or is it Paul? The Bible says, test all things. Examine all things. Hold fast to that which is true. Biblical discernment. I tested the Alpha Course and I found it on scripture. I mean, down. I tested Toronto and I found Toronto is deception. I reject Toronto. But I hold fast to what is good. I was in New York a few months ago. I saw David Wilkerson's church, a powerful, real mover guy. 
I hold to what's true. I hold to what's good. Now pay attention to verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you and who will bring it to pass. Again, the whole focus, the bottom line, the last thing he says is Jesus is coming back. There's going to be another Easter, another resurrection. May he himself sanctify you entirely in spirit, soul, and body. Spirit in Greek is pneuma. Soul is suke. We get the word psychology. And body is soma. Three different words. Now pay attention. This is what has gone wrong now. Body, soul, and spirit. We are three-dimensional beings. The reason we are three-dimensional beings is because we are imagio dei, made in the image and likeness of a triune God. That's the reason we're body, soul, and spirit. Secular psychology treats man as a bi-dimensional being. We are simply a body and a soul. We have emotions, we have intellect, and so on. Secular psychology treats us as a bi-dimensional being. There's two base, there are two basic kinds of secular psychology, two basic kinds, the Freudian and the Jungian. The Freudian is basically influenced or very compatible with Darwinism. It would reject any kind of spiritual property of man. 90% of our DNA is in common with apes, so we're simply an advanced model. That's it. The Jungian would see a kind of spiritual dimension of man, only it's not spiritual in the sense the Bible teaches. It's metaphysical. It's occultic. The collective unconsciousness is what it's called. It mixes the soul and spirit, you understand? But our soul, our spirit, is as distinct from our soul as our mind, our intellect, our emotions are from our body. They're related, but they're distinct. Secular psychology reduces man, made in the image and likeness of the triune God, from a three-dimensional being to a two-dimensional being. So too, Eastern religion, Eastern religious philosophy reduces man to a bi-dimensional being. The spirit and the soul are just confused. This is getting into the church, big time. There was a book by Young Yi Chao from Korea called The Fourth Dimension. In this book, he says, your subconscious imagination is your spirit. That's not true. Our spirit is our spirit. Our imagination is a function of the soul. He confuses the two. He says, you picture what you want, you visualize it, speaking into being. Hindus and Buddhists have known this for centuries, but now Jesus Christ has shown it to him. This is Buddhism. Young Chao, whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know. But I know what he teaches is not Christianity. What he teaches is Buddhism. He's a shaman. People in the West are very impressed by him because they think he has a big church. If you've been to the Far East, however, you wouldn't be impressed. In Bangkok, in Tokyo, in Singapore, you'll find Buddhist visualization cults all over the place. By the standards of Asia, where he comes from, he's no big deal. In fact, when the Toronto thing was happening, the Laughing Revival, the followers of Bhagwan Rajesh in India were doing the same thing. We showed the videos of Rodney Brown to ex-Hindus who were saved, and they said, that's what we were saved out of, that's Kundalini Yoga. Same time as Toronto, who was happening in India with the followers of Bhagwan Rajesh. It was also happening in China, between 40 and 50 million Chinese mystics practicing Qing Yoi were doing the same thing. People in the West are impressed by this stuff. But when you go to the Far East where it comes from, it's no big deal. No big deal. We are three-dimensional beings. Secular psychology reduces us to two-dimensional beings. Eastern religion reduces us to two-dimensional beings. In other words, Eastern religion, the New Age movement, 
and secular psychology are covalent. They have a natural magnetism, a natural attraction to each other. So you have pop psychology in the church. People like James Dobson who propagated the psycho babble. Then you have the young child with Eastern mysticism. What you wind up with is a different Christianity that doesn't understand the things of the spirit. It's all soulish. It's all simply the imagination. That's why people are running around having prophecies and visions that, as Jeremiah says, come from the futility of their own mind. The Lord showed me this. The Lord told me that I had a picture. These things are simply their imagination. They're confusing their soul with their spirit. We are tri-dimensional. The church has been invaded, even overtaken by pop psychology. It's been overtaken by people who are the opposite of Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy. Instead of telling people about hardship, they're telling people about blessings and victories that aren't even real. Instead of telling people about discipleship, they're telling people about how to trust in the world. Instead of telling people true doctrine, purity, and honesty, they're propagating error, they're propagating mixture, and they're propagating deceit. Instead of doing it for the love of the Lord, the love of the lost, and for the love of the church, they're doing it for the love of the Lord. 